Hey folks, it's August 1st. Beautiful day here. I thought it was time that we get back out in the woods and take a look at another tree species. Today we're going to look at shining sumac. They're uh, blooming here and uh, the bees are all over them. I just wanted to share some video footage with y'all. The shining sumac is also known as winged sumac and dwarf sumac. Let me let, me let you take a closer look at this. Absolutely covered up with honeybees today. I hope, uh, I hope the video footage is showing that. A few bumblebees and other pollinating insects as well. The shiny sumac is my favorite sumac primarily because it's so easy to identify. The leaves are shiny, but it also has these little winged leaflets between each leaflet on the compound leaf. Of course, uh, of course sumac is a deciduous tree uh, or, or large shrub. Uh, the dwarf sumac is one of the common names of this, and they don't get hardly as tall as some of the other species. Now, there's several species of sumac, and uh, depending on the part of the country that you live in, we'll talk about those different species and their respective ranges a little bit later. But I wanted to get out here and just uh, let y'all see what one of these looks like out in the field with, uh, with the bees really working it. These will produce a berry later in the year that uh, really looks a lot like the staghorn sumac. Matter of fact, when I was a kid, I always thought these were staghorn sumac until I learned better. But, uh, but the fruit is, is very similar to the staghorn and it's enjoyed by birds and various mammals. And uh, that is the main seed dispersal mechanism. You'll find these growing on uh, clearings, the edge of woods, edge and along roadsides. Some people may consider this an invasive species, but, uh, but for a beekeeper, it's a, it's a godsend. But y'all stay tuned. We'll, we'll take a closer look at the other sumac species and this one as well. And uh, I appreciate y'all watching my videos. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And uh, if, if you like my content, I really appreciate it if you would uh, give me a thumbs up and, uh, and, and make a comment. Y'all stay tuned. Thanks so much. Hey Riley, why are you tagging along with me today? She got rattlesnake bit again. It's about the fourth or fifth time in her in her lifetime. She got bit on the paw. But the swelling's about gone down and she's she's gonna be alright, looks like. Okay, here we got three more shiny sumacs. Up next to some uh, tulip poplar trees. Now we're a few hundred feet closer to the bee yard here, and uh, so there's a lot more bees on these. They don't seem to be paying me any mind at all. Okay, here we've got another example where they're collecting pollen. These, these trees are dioecious, meaning you have male trees and, and female trees. Notice the uh, yellow color in the blooms here and the dark orange pollen that the uh, girls are collecting. Okay, here's one covered up with honeybees and they're collecting nectar. Notice the flowers on these have a reddish color in the center. So since these uh, trees are dioecious, the, only the females will have the cluster of berries later in the year. Lots of bumblebees on this one too. Every time a little breeze comes through, it stirs them up a little. Awesome. Okay, folks, I've put together a few slides for us so we can take a closer look at uh, the different sumac species and their respective ranges. The shiny sumac genus species is Rus copolinum. It has several common names, winged sumac, dwarf sumac, flaming sumac, mountain sumac, just to name a few. Uh, the bark is real easy to identify once you get used to it. It has these red spots or pores on it and it's uh, got some greenish uh, brown to gray coloration as well they're generally relatively small uh, rarely rarely higher than 10 feet tall although i've seen them 20 feet tall or more okay as we mentioned earlier the, the leaves are compound you're, you're going to generally have between 7 to 17 leaflets on the uh, rachis uh, the, the, the rachis 
or the section of stem that connects the leaflets together has a, a wing section, as you can see here in this photo. And that makes the shining sumac the easiest to identify. And you can tell at a very quick glance, it's not poison sumac. This picture shows uh, multiple colonies, as you can see off in the distance there, of uh, shining sumac. And this is, of course, later in the year after they've already turned color. But the uh, interesting thing about the sumacs is they'll they'll put out rhizomes and, uh, and these suckers and other colonies as far as 30 feet away will uh, can, can sprout up off of the parent colony. They generally, according to USDA, will generally start losing vigor after about 15 years. So they're a species that moves into a cleared area relatively quick and uh, makes way for other species then to, uh, to come in later. The sumac honey is uh, described as a heavy body, dark amber in color, supposedly has a, a medium strong, a sweet caramel taste and a tart finish. I thought that was a, an interesting description. I can't say that I've ever tried sumac honey specifically, uh, although uh, more than likely I have in a blend uh, from some from our local honey here. Uh, sumac honey is said to be great for cooking and baking. All right, if we uh, take a look at the native range of uh, the shining sumac, you can see it's pretty well restricted to uh, a portion of the southeast. And staghorn sumac is Rus typhina, a little bit more of a northeast species, as you'll see here on the range map. And then also, too, notice the uh, fruit cluster or the berries uh, have more of a fuzzy appearance to them as well as the stem. If you take a close look at that stem, you'll see it, it is fuzzy. And the uh, that's something that the smooth sumac does not have. Uh, the smooth sumac stems are smooth, hence the name smooth sumac. And here's, a, here's some pictures of smooth sumac and uh, the range. As you'll see, the range is qu quite a bit more extensive for the smooth sumac. And its genus species is Rus glabra. All, all three of these species have very similar properties in their edibility of the fruit. Um, as, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, they are enjoyed by various bird species and mammals. And uh, the, uh, the leaves are heavily browsed by white-tailed white deer. One thing you want to watch out for is poison sumac. And as you'll see there, the uh, genus species is Toxicodendron vernix. It was formerly in the Roos genus, but it was changed sometime in the past. However, they're still cousins. And so uh, it's real easy to tell when the berries are on because the, the berries on poison sumac are wide, as you can see here in the photos. So be extremely careful around any sumac that you're not certain what it is. Uh, generally, these will only grow in wet or marshy settings, from what I understand. Okay, I like to go to honeybee.net pretty regular and, uh, and, and, and click on my region, check out the various species uh, of, of nectar sources, and their expected bloom month, and so forth. And uh, interestingly, they list... Uh, sumac in my region is a non-significant source. I think that could vary. I, I would consider it a significant source for me here personally, and and I guess it just depends upon the availability of sumac to your to your colonies. Yeah, and in here is just a screenshot of of what it looks like when you click on and go into your region. You'll see all of the potential sources. The ones that are highlighted are considered significant sources for your area. Looking at some of the old literature, particularly American Honey Plants, uh, Frank Chapman Pellet's book from 1920, one of my favorite resources, uh, they, they list the uh, sources in Tennessee. And interestingly, I thought, uh, uh, was, I thought it was interesting that sumac was number 15 on the list. You can get yourself a free copy and PDF version of American Honey Plants, as well as uh, many other uh, 
resources available in the public domain at Strathcona Beekeepers Library. And I'll put a link to that in the description of the video. When we start looking at some of the historical uses, there are many, too many to, to list in this discussion, but, uh, uh, but, but some uh, American Indians use these for, to treat colds, fever, and scurvy. Uh, they could grind the berries and mix them with clay, use that as a salve on open wounds. It's, uh, it's also shown to have benefits for uh, diarrhea, dysentery, sore throats, infections, asthma, and cold sores. Uh, and you may know that uh, some beekeepers have actually used the dried berries in their smoker as a smoker fuel. They have a pleasant odor, and uh, it's been said that there's a possibility it could help control varroa mites. Uh, sumac tea is, is really easy to make. Uh, and, uh, and it's high in vitamin C and, and delicious. And so, uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video to a, uh, to a short video of a Cherokee lady in Oklahoma that, uh, that shows the traditional way to make, uh, Indian lemonade or, or sumac tea. It has several, several other common names, but, uh, if you have time, check that out. It's just a few short minutes. The uh, leaves of uh, sumac were apparently used as, as tobacco and or mixed with tobacco by Native Americans. Uh, some pipes that were unearthed uh, had residue of smooth sumac, and these were found in Washington State and, uh, and, and dated back to, to 1,400 years ago. Well, folks, you know, one thing that I came to realize when I became a beekeeper is that uh, sumac is is awesome. I've often said that uh, one person's weed is another person's flower. And, and so that seems to be the case in beekeeping. There's so many things that I didn't pay close attention to when I was younger as far as as far as their bloom cycle and, uh, and, and the pollinators. But uh, but sumac seems to be very desirable to the honeybees. And so uh, I, I hope y'all enjoyed this uh, short presentation and uh, I really appreciate you watching my video so much and uh, may God bless you, your family and your bees. And we'll see you next time.